Hi, I'm Rachel Ladd Patterson. This is Women in Priesthood, a place for faithful LDS women, young women, and men to study priesthood power and how it applies to our lives in concrete ways, and more importantly, answer the call of Prophet Russell M. Nelson to prayerfully study all we can about priesthood power. This week's a really special week because 184 years ago, the priesthood keys were fully restored in the Kirtland Temple um, through the Prophet Joseph Smith, and we often forget this was also happening during the week before Easter. So on the 27th of March, which was seven days before Easter, um, the dedication of the Kirtland Temple occurred. And seven days later, the prophet Elijah appeared to Joseph Smith along with Jesus Christ, Elias, and Moses to restore the full priesthood um, power to the earth. So when we think about the idea that Christ lives, it, we mean it in a very literal way. It's no mistake that this full restoration happened on Easter Sunday in 184 years ago. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we're always talking about the word restoration and that's a big, you know, we're so excited about the, the anniversary of the restoration this year. But what do we mean when we say the word restore? Like what is, what is actually being restored? And one of the things that Joseph Smith was promised as he talks about in Doctrine and Covenants 84, it says that Joseph Smith would restore again that which was lost unto you. So we have to ask this question, what is Joseph Smith restoring? What is being lost that is so that he's such a critical component of? One of the reasons I'm kind of a geek about priesthood restoration is because my parents are both converts to the church in Vermont. They actually joined when they were both 18 and 19. And as a result, they went on missions in their 20s to Europe, came home, um, had me and my sisters, and they raised us in Sharon, Vermont. And for those of you who know your Joseph Smith history, that's actually where Joseph Smith was born. It's where he had his operation, and it's where he, he spent most of his early years in this community where I grew up. And what's so interesting is I, so I lived in an area that really has echoes of a world before priesthood keys were restored. And when we talk about the priesthood, we reviewed a few weeks ago the idea of there's two kinds of priesthoods. So go back to our picture in our diagram, and I'll be uh, having these notes available. If you want, I'll leave the link below because this diagram really helps clarify which priesthoods we're talking about. In the first class on what is the priesthood, we talked about the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood as illustrated by a dotted line, right? Because this is a temporary priesthood. This is a temporary priesthood. This is the priesthood we use to, to govern the church. You can hold authority in this priesthood when you are set apart for specific callings, like a sister missionary or a primary president. And this is a very important priesthood. But as Joseph Smith was told, the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods were preparatory priesthoods. Well, what were they preparing for? They were preparing for the patriarchal priesthood. In our diagram, the patriarchal priesthood is illustrated by a heart because the patriarchal priesthood is an eternal priesthood power. It's the eternal power of God. And it's all about God being able to covenant with his children and remain in relationship with them you enter into the patriarchal priesthood when you receive your endowments. Now, when you look back at early church history texts, they refer to the endowment as the endowment of power, which I think is a really great phrase because it, you know, you have to ask the question, well, what kind of power are we talking about? Priesthood power. When you receive your endowment, it's an endowment of priesthood power. What power? The patriarchal power. And this is a very important bonding of yourself to God and entering into his patriarchal covenant. You ask people, well, what happened in Kirtland? They regularly give you a rundown of the schedule of what happened in Kirtland on April 3rd or on March 27th or 29th. They'll be like, at nine o'clock this happened, at 10 o'clock this happened, and that's not actually what I'm asking. What we are asking is, what happened in Kirtland that's significant to me? Specifically, what happened in Kirtland that is important to me as a woman? Why does it matter? What happened there and why was it so important? And it's really important to remember that the story of the restoration of the priesthood is a lot like watching the BBC version of uh, Pride and Prejudice, which I'm sure some of us are doing with all of the um, requirements to stay at home. 
where you spend a good eight hours watching the beautiful love story of Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet and all of its twists and turns and you, you know, maybe you're getting over a breakup or whatever, you get your ice cream, get your girlfriends and you sit out, you camp out for eight hours, maybe it's over a course of a few days and then inevitably in the second to last scene or the last scene where Dar Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth are getting together, you have a friend that walks in to the very last scene and they're like, oh, this is cute. You're like, I, no, you don't understand. This is huge. This is amazing. Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth are finally going to get together. This is so incredible. And you're kind of annoyed by them because they don't understand what a big deal this is. And it's because they don't know the backstory. They don't know the seven and a half hours that you have invested in watching this love story. And on a lot of levels, this is a parallel to us and the greatest love story that that we have ever known, which is the great love story of Heavenly Father and his family, of Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father and their children. And we are walking in on the last scene of that love story. So this great love story begins in our pre-mortal existence, where Heavenly Parents, our Heavenly Parents, gathered us all together and they presented to us a plan. And the Book of Abraham really illustrates this reality to us that before we came to earth we had heavenly parents um, a BYU Dean of Religion Robert Millet points out this quote in the premortal existence our first estate we lived under the patriarchal order the family order it was an order consisting of father mother and children an order presided over an order presided over by our parents our souls are eternally attuned and acclimated to family things so the patriarchal order was a power of God that kept our family together in the premortal existence with our heavenly parents. And they, when we decided to come to earth, we entered into a covenant with them, a relationship with them. That was a strong bond. We came to earth and what was the state of our relationship with God? Well, there are two major stories, two major books that follow this relationship of our standing with God as a community and as individuals. They're known as the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament, it tells a story about our standing with God being a matter of our family, our tribe, and our ethnic group's relationship with God, and whether or not that group or family or tribe is obedient to his commandments. We see in Moses, Moses had the patriarchal order of the priesthood, but we learned that at the end of that, his people were disobedient, and so they lost the patriarchal order of the priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 8452 states, the covenants being broken through transgression. And this was instruction given to Joseph Smith about how Moses and his people lost the patriarchal order of the priesthood. This is a power to seal us to God. What a tragedy that we you know, this covenant relationship, this relationship we have with our heavenly parents was broken. That is hugely terrible to even think about. Later in Doctrine and Covenants, it also talks about how Joseph Smith was meant to come forth and restore this broken covenant to bring about a repairing of this broken covenant. And you have to understand that this relationship with God is a covenant. And so when that covenant is broken, it means our connection to God is broken. Well, the next story you guys are really gonna appreciate because we just spent the last year studying the New Testament. And the New Testament is another story of our covenant relationship with God. And it talks about our individual, really emphasizes our individual relationship with God, right? Jesus Christ came to the earth and he emphasized an individual relationship with God based on our belief and acceptance of Jesus Christ as our savior. He makes a point to hit that out of the park, right? He makes a point to go and preach to the non-Jews, to preach to the members of society who were maybe rejected, to the people who were, to the Samaritans, to women, to people who maybe would have, wouldn't have been considered of the right status. And the covenant under this story in the New Testament, which makes sense why it like really resonates with so many of us, is it really emphasizes this ability, this opportunity we have to have an individual relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, so we know during the time of Jesus Christ, 
on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, James, and John were given the keys of the patriarchal order of the priesthood, but as is shown in Jesus Christ's life, the temple was defiled and those keys were also lost again. So again, we have another tragedy where the covenant where we either had as an individual group of Israel or as individuals with God is broken as a result of those keys being lost. So again, we're returning to our original question about what restoration means and what's been lost. What's been lost is our relationship with our heavenly parents. And so what Joseph Smith facilitated was the restoring of that relationship with our heavenly parents. That's what the covenant is. That's what the patriarchal priesthood and what happened in Kirtland allowed to be restored, is that we were enabled to come back into a relationship with our heavenly parents again after years and years of that relationship having been broken. Moroni promised Joseph Smith in as early as 1823, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers. So early on, Joseph Smith was being prepared to restore this relationship and to turn our hearts to the fathers and to turn the fathers to the children. It was about restoring our relationship with our heavenly parents and within the the human family. So it was this week, the week of Easter, 184 years ago, that the patriarchal priesthood, the priesthood that allows us to be reconciled with God, was restored in the Kirtland, Ohio temple. I love what Spencer Harper, a uh, church historian says, where he says, we don't just build, God doesn't want temples to be built just to dedicate them. He builds them because he wants to visit them. He wants to dwell with us. He yearns to be close to us. Now, when we go back to our diagram, it's, it's just helpful to see how this works out. We have the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, which run the church. They administer covenants and callings. The most important covenant they administer is baptism and then sacrament ordinances. But as soon as you receive the endowment of power, you enter into the patriarchal priesthood. This is a priesthood that can also be termed a familial priesthood or a temple priesthood because you enter into the patriarchal priesthood order when you receive your endowments. This is so beautiful how the restoration of the patriarchal priesthood reconciles these two covenant stories, right? The question is, well, what is our standing with God? The Old Testament says it's a matter of belonging to the right tribal group, the right ethnic family. Well, the New Testament says, no, it's about your individual relationship with God and your acceptance of Jesus Christ as, as our Savior. Well, as we can see in the temple, and by the way, I'm only talking about things that is publicly released by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'll link several of the incredible pages they have below on the temple ceremonies. But when we receive our endowment in the temple, it's an individual bonding of our hearts to God that reconciles the New Testament's story of an individual acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then when we progress through the patriarchal order of the priesthood into the sealing power, we see that we are entering into a community relationship with God, a community relationship in our individual families, and we're entering into, we're re-entering into that community family um, that is all of Heavenly Father's children. It's really amazing to consider how the patriarchal order of the priesthood, the priesthood that was restored through Joseph Smith on April 3rd in the Kirtland, Ohio temple, reconciles this great long story of the, of the relationship that children have to God, the covenant relationship. We have through the endowment ordinance, a reconciliation of our individual relationship with God, and through the temple ceilings, we have a reconciliation of our community relationship with God. I think the really interesting part of, and why I've been so passionate about this Women in Priesthood project, is the emphasis on that in receiving of your individual endowment. Because for years, women would only receive their endowment right before they were about to be sealed. But now, with so many young women going on missions earlier in their life and then getting married slightly later, we have so many of us staying in that space of the patriarchal order of the priesthood it, where you've received your endowment, but you haven't been sealed to someone yet. 
And we learn so much about the patriarchal order of the priesthood and being part of that, hum that eternal family that is powerful in understanding the patriarchal order of the priesthood and understanding that when you enter into that patriarchal covenant through receiving your endowments, you are entering into a priesthood power, an eternal power. That is why in this diagram, the patriarchal order of the priesthood is depicted with a solid line is because this patriarchal order of the priesthood is the order we existed in before earth life and is the eternal order we will exist in now and through all eternities with our heavenly parents. President Oaks said, our theology begins with heavenly parents. Our highest aspirations is to be like them. Robert Millet also talks about the, the sealing powers of the temple and how this is really us striving to emulate our heavenly parents and the divine family with which we came from. He says, Robert Millet says, the patriarchal order is a family order a partnership, a joint stewardship. It is an eternal principle. The man and the woman are not alone. Neither is the man without the woman nor the woman with, without the man in the Lord. So we also learn that the patriarchal order of the priesthood is not just a space where women have equal standing before the Lord, but it's also a place where men and women and everyone in the community is united. Zion is the pure in heart. It's the uniting of our, of our eternal family. So this week, as we think about Easter, when we think about Passover, it's also so beautifully symbolic. We talk about Jesus Christ dying and then how amazing it is that he awoke and he lives. But when we think about how this exact same week, 183 years ago, sorry, 184 years ago, Jesus Christ doesn't just live. He lives to be very active in our lives. And on Easter Sunday in 1834, he appeared in the Kirtland Temple and restored this covenant priesthood. He restored this relationship so that we could be in relationship with our heavenly parents. And that is what happened in Kirtland. And that's why it's so important for us as women to understand that the priesthood power has been restored and it is very applicable to us in our lives, in our relationship with our heavenly parents, in our relationship with our families here on this earth, and in our relationship to the entire human family. I hope you'll take time this week to, especially as temples are closed worldwide, to think about what the opportunity we have to have access to this priesthood, this patriarchal priesthood in our lives as women means. How lucky we are. No generation of women has really ever understood or been blessed with this amount of priesthood power in their lives as we have, particularly because temples dot the globe. President Uchtdorf was very clear in speaking about how priesthood restoration is an ongoing process. I'm so excited that you guys have decided to join me on this journey. I think what's really cool about our opportunity this year is that so many of us have a really deep understanding of the priest of the Book of Mormon. And so we're able to look much deeper into the Book of Mormon truths. What's amazing is how, especially where we are right now in the Book of Mormon, in 2 Nephi, into Alma, is that there's this beautiful transition that happens in the Book of Mormon right now, which we'll be talking about in coming weeks where you see the family covenant, this family of Lehi transition from a relationship with God based on their family obedience to a place where they also are allowing individual people to come in to enter into this covenant based on their belief in Jesus Christ and their acceptance of him as their savior. I hope that you'll take the time to log on to our website. We're gonna have class notes available there, especially this diagram. Every week we'll have class notes available and we're also going to be getting a study guide going on ways that you can, it's all meant to support your personal study of priesthood power and women and support your understanding of priesthood truths being taught in the Book of Mormon. So I hope you guys have a great week and I really hope you have a very special Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm.